Hi, Chief. We're on good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone out there in Facebook land. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Lewis Reyes, and I am your Exchange's Senior Enlisted Advisor. Today, we have a big guest. See these guns? His guns are much <laughs> bigger than mine. <laughs> but uh, he's a great dude. But before we get to him, let me introduce my co-host today, Leah Matthews and uh, Roy Montez. How y'all doing? Hi, Chief. Doing good. How are you? Roy, you working it out? Doing well over here. Just oh, my crazy. gosh. Hey, hey, 1001, 1002. We got yes, some sir. Yes, sir. to talk about today with our guests. Roy, you mind introducing them? Definitely, Chief. Yeah, we're excited about today's guest. He's an instructor in the Army and an enlisted athlete. He's one of our biggest, no pun intended, names in professional bodybuilding. Our friends over at Redcon One helped us connect with him today. Please welcome Cedric, the one, McMillan. Hello, hello. Cedric, thanks so much for joining us. We're honored to have you on and thanks to everybody tuning in. Let us know if you have any questions for Cedric. We'll be reading those throughout the live broadcast. Leave some love for him and let us know where you're watching from. And if you don't follow us, you should do that because Chief Chat is every Tuesday and Thursday and that way you'll know who's coming up next. And to enjoy this big guest with your friends, now's a good time to start your watch party. Hey, Cedric, so let's get this going, right? We're excited to have you on today. Where, where are you currently at? And uh, how have you been surviving this time of, of, of maybe staying at home, coming to work, the, the whole pandemic? What's going yeah, on? Where well, are you at? Well, I'm in my home state of South Carolina now, and uh, we've been on active orders. I got a team. We've been on active orders since the end of March, and uh, we're doing some missions around the state, helping out with um, COVID virus testing sites. And uh, so that's keeping us, keeping me pretty fucking busy. Um, uh, nothing, honestly, nothing else has been going on but that because, you know, you never know when you're going to get a mission. It's not like a normal eight to five type thing. Um, we may be scheduled. We may not have any missions tomorrow. And then by the time we go to bed tonight, there's a mission for tomorrow, you know. So um, like, like last week, whenever I scheduled this, we were we didn't have any, any missions for Tuesday afternoon. And of course, Sunday, it came down that, hey, we, we need you guys to be at this place all week long. So here I am. Uh, so as I would like, it would be more ideal for me to be at a laptop on some Wi-Fi, stuff like that. But instead, I'm talking to you off the back of my truck and trying to watch my soldiers at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Well, we really appreciate it. We appreciate you joining good. us and improvising here. Yeah, yeah. One thing I can say, um, uh, from what I can tell, it seems like, you know, dealing with this, with the shutdowns and all of that stuff, it seems that it could be a real big inconvenience for people because things are so different from normal life where you have access to all of the stuff that you normally can do and go places you can normally go to the gym, for example, um, and for your schedule to just be so altered um, in such a way that makes it difficult to do things like you normally would. <laughs> and uh, like, I, I think I told somebody this morning, I said, hey, <laughs> my whole life is that way. Um, you know, if it's not my kids or it's my mom, you know, she has dementia now. So that's very unpredictable. Um, and then working as well, you know, nothing, no day ever goes like you would want it to go. Uh, having time where you can't go to the gym and all of that stuff, that's normal for me because if we're working or we got a mission, you know, like this morning, for example, I have to wake up at 3.30 and uh, have to be ready to leave at 5 a.m. Uh, to make it down here for our mission. It's not possible to get to the gym and be ready to roll at 5 o'clock in the morning. And then uh, when I get off work, I have to go watch my mom. So it's not possible to go to the gym, you know, before I go see her because I need to be there immediately when I get off work, you know. Um, so that's one of those times where it's like, man, this just is not a perfect match for uh, my bodybuilding career. But stuff like that always happens to me. And whenever I have good days where I can't make time to do what I have to do, I do it. And when I have days where I can't make time to do the stuff like that that I want to do, I don't do it. Um, and what I try to do is not 
get so stressed out about what I'm unable to do. Try not to get so stressed out about things that I can't change. You know, you guys have heard that before and then try to find ways to where I can make it happen. Uh, for example, um, the city that we're in now, I got on my GPS and looked around and tried to find some gyms that were close by. And uh, I found a gym that was, you know, a couple of miles away and I talked to them and said, hey, you know, when we get off work, can we come by here and work out? You know, yeah, of course, come on, you and your team can come. So this way I can squeeze in a workout as soon as I get off work and then get on the road and get home, you know? So what I try to do is spend all of the energy that most people spend stressing out because stuff ain't going right. And I use that energy to try to problem solve, you know? And of course, sometimes you can't always solve the problem. Sometimes you just have to live with things not going your way and it's cool, you know, because it's definitely not the end of the world because after, you know, this bodybuilding, after these muscles and all that, we still have a life to live. Um, we still have, you know, families to try to take care of and things like that. So I try not to let things that are bodybuilding related um, get me get me to where I feel like I can't function as a normal human. Yeah. I think a, a big takeaway is, is the mindset, the drive, and the determination that you've uh, set forward to pursuing uh, your fit, uh, not only your fitness goals, but also, you know, your, your approach to life in general. But yeah, before, hey, look, I can yeah. tell you, I, I've, people have said, oh, if only Cedric was more dedicated to bodybuilding, uh, if only Cedric had a champion's mindset and was willing to do whatever it takes to win, he could be a champion and he could be this and that. And I, I try to say, though, the people who say that have no clue what it's like to try to have two careers um, and give both of them 100%. It takes far less dedication for you to say, okay, it's too easy. Let me just focus on this, you know, and do that and put all of your energy towards it. But when that's not an option and you have kids that need you and you got family that need you and then you have soldiers that need you and you have a career that needs you and then you have uh, this bodybuilding sport that I want, <laughs> You know, then it's not such an easy thing for me to say, hey, sorry, world, I have to focus on getting ready for the Olympia now. So nothing else can be done or nothing else matters. It's, it's just not possible for me. Now, um, that feels fine until I get on stage and compete against a bunch of guys that can dedicate 24 hours of their day to preparing for this show. And then the difference that you see between their physique and mine is the amount of time I'm unable to dedicate. Um, but I have to be a man about that and accept that because I, you know, made the decision that, you know, I have, I have so much to try to do and I want to be a bodybuilder too. So in understanding that there's going to be a difference with um, how I'm able to present myself because I'm stretched so thin over so many different avenues then yeah, I'm probably going to get my butt kicked on stage by this guy that's able to dedicate himself completely to the sport, you know? So I understand that. And uh, I, I began to not so much focus on trying to win, but focus on trying to not stop trying. I focus on trying to not stop trying. Why? Because I believe 99.9% .9 of the people that we the word that the business of bodybuilding will use is market. The 99.9% .9 of people that we market, uh, and for us as bodybuilders, the 99.9% .9 of the people that we try to inspire, they got jobs to go to. They got lives to live. They got stuff to do other than eat, sleep, and work out. And I wanted to be able to do that the same way that they have to do it. To Look, okay, so look, if I sleep 12 hours a day, and I eat eight meals a day, and I work out two or three hours a day, and my whole day is based on me working out and eating and I have nothing else to do, it is far easier for me to say, hey, follow me, do what I do, right? But how much credibility does those words have to somebody that has so much other responsibilities to do? So when I'm able to say, listen, sometimes you just gotta say, screw it. Sometimes you just can't make it to the gym or Sometimes you got to say screw work and leave the gym early or leave work early. Or sometimes you got to sneak off and go eat a meal when your boss is not looking, you know, so, stuff like that. Or, hey, you know, when you got to take canned tuna to the field with you because you're on a mission 
and you want to try to get your protein in. How can you do that? I can give these words through experience and the experience brings credibility. Now, I may not have an Olympia championship to add credibility to my words, but I have the experience of trying to do both of these careers at the same time that brings credibility, you know? And, and I, think, I think to me that that journey alone, the attempt at trying to do both um, may, I hope that that could be more inspiring for the people that are watching, you know? Absolutely, Cedric. And speaking of your journey, what age did you start lifting weights? What age did you start training? And was oh man, so uh, you're not gonna believe this, but um, I have been doing push-ups and stuff like that ever since I was about six years old. Um, back then, um, bodybuilding used to come on TV. It was on a sports channel, and uh, so I used to watch Lee Haney on TV, and there was a show called Body Shapers that had like aerobic stuff or bodies in motion. Uh, it was one of them was aerobics and one of them was like working out in the gym and stuff. And I used to watch the, I don't know why I was so fascinated with him. You know, when I watch Arnold Schwarzenegger and his movies with his muscles and Rambo, you know, and I, I just wanted to look like that. I don't, I have no clue why it just was something that attracted me from the very beginning. And uh, so in looking at those exercise shows, I said, oh, to get muscles like them, you have to do the stuff that they do, you know, and learning little stuff here and there from, older people, teenagers and stuff. Hey, do some push-ups. Let me show you how to do a push-up. And I would just take that and just go wild with it, you know? Um, and so I, I had little at-home workouts that I would do with, you know, I used to curl water jugs, like gallon water jugs. You fill it up to the top and it's eight pounds. Halfway is four pounds. So I would use that to measure the weight that I have and do curls with, with that. I would mm -hmm. sometimes get school books and wrap them with a belt and use that belt as a way to have, you know, weights in my hand doing stuff. And uh, that was eight years old, you know, doing stuff like that. I got my first weight set when I was 12, but I couldn't put it together until I was 13. <laughs> so <laughs> when my mom got me this weight set for Christmas uh, because her boyfriend at the time said, you know, he loved trying to lift weights. Won't you get him some real weights, you know? And she got it, but she was afraid for me to use it thinking I would hurt myself. Well, this same boyfriend, he said, he talked into finally letting me put it together. And so I did. And I had a big brother that came over to the house and he would show me how to do different things on my weight bench. It came with a little instruction book um, with Arnold Schwarzenegger in it. And I would look mm -hmm. at Arnold in the book and I would try to copy the moves that he did. And that was, you know, 12, 13 years old. Now I'm, I'm lifting weights for real, you know. Uh, I can remember, man, before I could even put the weight set together, I had some milk crates that I stole from beside the trash can, you know, the trash dumpster. We live in an apartment complex and there's a trash dumpster, you know, where everybody takes their trash. So I stole some milk, milk crates from there and I put the milk crates in my room and I put pillows on it and I would use that as a bench. And I went inside the box where my weight bench equipment was and I just took out the bar and took out some dumbbells and took out some weights. And so I would use those uh, when my mom was at work on my milk crates was my bench. <laughs> and then whenever I finished, I would hide everything under my bed, you know, so she didn't know that I was actually lifting weights when she was gone, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of how my weightlifting started. Cedric, hey, that's Cedric. incredible. So, sorry, yeah. Chief, go ahead. Hey, Cedric, I was going to ask... Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask, you talked about Arnold a lot, but, I, you know, you have a lot of accolades. You won the Arnold Classic in 2017, and you was up on stage with him. How was that yeah. meeting uh, maybe one of your, your heroes when you were a kid? Um, so in 2015, I got fourth place at the Arnold. And uh, at a seminar that Arnold did Sunday, he said with his own mouth, I think Cedric was the best. And wow, that for me was equivalent to winning the highest – accolade that anybody could ever win in this bodybuilding sport for me so from that point in 2015 forward I feel like I've already accomplished what I anything that I ever could want to for Arnold to be my favorite and for him to be my idol and then for him to number one just simply notice me and then number two for him to say I was his favorite and that he liked me there's no trophy that can top that uh, so when I won in 2017, that was simply, okay, 
Now I get to stand beside him on mm-hmm. stage, but I was already so satisfied just with him knowing who I was. And, you know, for him acknowledging, you know, what he thought about my, my physique and my presentation. Um, so I, I'll be honest, there's so many times I've had dreams about winning the Olympia, like full color dreams, uh, winning the Arnold, winning the Olympia and, and saying whatever my speech is and so many things that I have to say that technically I feel I don't even to deserve to say those things as a loser, if that makes sense to you. Um, so I just get my butt kicked at a show. I'm not supposed to have a lot to say. Uh, I'm not supposed to have a bunch of inspiring words that matter so much because I just got my butt kicked. You, you get what I'm saying? That That's kind of the, mm-hmm. the pressure that I put on myself. So when you win, now what you say matters. You understand? Um, and I know technically it may not be that way in the real world. It's not that way, you know, but that's the way I put it for myself. Um, so when I did actually win the Arnold, that was one of those times for me to, you know, people always talk about the speech of the Arnold, the speech of the Arnold. It wasn't nothing that was prepared. All of it came to me in the moment as I was talking, but I, I've always knew in my heart that if I ever get a chance to be in the position I will say what needs to be said, not for me, but for the sport, because I feel that my position in this sport is so much bigger than just me and where I place at a show. I actually came into this sport to to try to uh, change it in a sense, uh, to make people remember bodybuilding from a time where I fell in love with it. And, And that's what my goal has been. And whether I win shows or not, trying to make those changes, the goal is to make, help usher in those changes of the sport. So I can remember uh, when I turned pro and all of a sudden now they want to create men's physique. Well, what is men's physique? It's a, you know, an attempt to show off this type of body, blah, blah, blah. Now they got, you know, classic bodybuilding and stuff. And what is that? Another attempt to try to showcase this. And I can remember times coming off stage or before I went to stage or while I'm prepping for a show and people say, hey man, you gotta quit posing like that. Or you gotta quit trying to be so old school. That time is gone. You need to get with what's what's gonna help you win shows now. You need to pose in a way that's gonna help you win shows now. Nobody does that anymore. But I didn't give a damn about what nobody does anymore. This is what I think is beautiful and this is what I wanna represent. And so when I can see now that what I would consider you know, the old school method of posing and bodybuilding and presenting your body and the proportions and the symmetry, when I can see that begin to become more popularized now, then I feel like I'm achieving the goal of trying to help usher in, you know, another side of the sport. Not to say, you know, because when I came in, it was mass monsters, right? How big can you be? And not to say that there's no place for that because there definitely is. It should be as much diversity in the sport of bodybuilding as there are within the athletes and within society. We need that diversity, but I'm here to represent this part of it. You know what I mean? And so uh, when I have an opportunity to be on stage as a winner, I wanna say what what needs to be said in order to move the sport forward, in order to help adjust people's ideals of the sport, um, to try to help us be as mainstream as we possibly can, to help us be seen in a positive light, as opposed to being seen as freaks. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, I guess that's a long way to answer how did I feel being on stage with Arnold in 2017, but that's what it was about to me. I felt like, okay, Cedric, now you're on the podium teaching a big ass classroom full of students. What do you think they need to know? What is important for them to know right now? It's not about, oh, thank you. Um, I did this, I'm so great. You know, no, 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 it's about this sport and what we need to do to help move the sport in a positive way. And so that's what I take those opportunities for. Yeah. Excellent. So Cedric, you're currently serving in the army as a staff sergeant, and it sounds Mm -hmm. like you are used to improvising for your whole life. Um, Tell us a little bit, what have you learned as a soldier that's made you a better bodybuilder? Oh God. 
it seems like in a lot of ways, being a soldier takes away from your ability to be a bodybuilder. <laughs> well, well, a professional, world-class, uh, fully focused bodybuilder, I will say, right? Um, but what being a soldier has done is just like you said, improvising. Uh, but for me on a personal level, what, what being a soldier has done was keeps me in the reality of knowing that this life that we live, this existence we have, has so much more important things in it than just going to the gym and lifting weights. How good does my muscles look? There's so much more important things in this existence than that. And so being in the army reminds me of that, right? Because whereas I'm trying to figure out how can I squeeze out a couple of hours of, to work out, um, there's missions that need to be done and places that we need to be where some people are just trying to survive, you know? Um, I, you know, I wish that I could be spending my days getting ready for uh, the next competition that we do, but instead we're down here helping with a deadly ass disease. You know what I mean? And that is way more important than how many muscles I can grow in this time. So that when all of this is said and done and when, you know, when my song has finished playing and when the last page of my story has been turned, at least there will be more in my book than just this one chapter on bodybuilding. You know what I mean? And so uh, that, that it, I have to say it keeps me grounded. It keeps me selfless because uh, that's another thing. Bodybuilders are not notorious for being selfish and being a soldier, especially being a leader keeps me selfless. Um, as I, now I will tell you, bodybuilding has helped me be a better soldier, right? Cause you know, I can be big and intimidating and uh, <laughs> I, I, sometimes I can get people to do stuff without even cussing them out. You know, I can just say, <laughs> say it they're just ready to do it, you know? Uh, and so that helps me out a whole lot. You know, it, I guess it gains a little bit of respect cause nobody, here, here's what they say and they think I don't hear. Nobody want to make that big dude mad. You know, that's what they say. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cedric, let me just chime in real quick and read off. You're getting a lot of likes over here on Facebook. Uh, Blake okay. uh, wants to mention that your dedication, it's good to see you not give up on your dreams. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Preston agrees with you right on. Uh, yeah. We have Tony watching. Uh, we have Cecilia. Good afternoon. She's all the way from Maryland. Uh, Monique, thank you for your service. Blake, again, good morning. Um, you know, I had a, the honor of tackling a few ACFT exercises uh, last year. And I, I want to mention, do you have any words of advice or, or any tips on techniques uh, for anyone watching on how to accomplish and, you know, tackle the ACFT from your perspective? He looks frozen. All right, Cedric. Cedric, you blacked out. So for everybody watching, Cedric did let us know before we went live that he is outdoors working uh, his job in the army. So he said he, he may lose some signal and it looks like that has happened, right? So hopefully he can join us again. Well, we'll give him a few, uh, We'll give him a few minutes real quick to come back. But for those of you wondering, uh, Cedric has tons of accolades. If you uh, <laughs> if you look at his resume here, he was number one 2008 MPC Junior USA Championships, uh, um, 2009 MPC National Championships, number one 2011 Europe, uh, Europe, Europa Orlando Pro, number one 2012 New York Pro, um, number one Fibo Power Germany, Olympia 2013, uh, 12th place, Arnold 2014, third place, 2015, fourth. Then, of course, he got in 2017, the Arnold Classic, first place, 2015, Golden State Pro. Uh, uh, more, more recently, he placed Arnold Classic, Australia second, uh, 2019, Olympia seventh, 2019, Fit Parade Pro Bodybuilding, number one, 
in 2019, Romania Muscle Fest Pro Men's Bodybuilding, first place. 2019, Japan's Pro Men's Bodybuilding, second place. So he has a lot of accolades and to wow. be able to, to, you know, pull those results, managing a, a career in the United States Army is truly impressive. Uh, Looks like he's back in the waiting room for us. So. All right, let's bring him in. <clears throat> I also want to read a comment real quick. Real, real quick. Jose Martinez says, when the last page of my story has been turned, I hope there's more than bodybuilding in my book. Beautiful words. So he was quoting Cedric. Okay. Cedric, you're back. Hey, Cedric, we see you. See us, Cedric? Do you hear us? I see you, but we don't hear you. It's, it got stuck again. Yeah, it looks like he... Oh, there we go. Hey, Cedric, you see, you hear us? It's connecting. All right. Yeah, there we go. There we go. You're on mute, Cedric. You're on mute. There we go. <laughs> there we go, Cedric. All right. Welcome back, Cedric. Hang on. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Fuck, I can't hear you guys. Hold on a second. What in the hell? <laughs> <laughs> well, Chief. So let me tell you what happened while I try to get some uh, signal here uh, with my Bluetooth. So my phone got hot. It's, it's hot out here. So I had to come inside and put my phone right in the, uh, the air conditioner. Hey, Cedric. So the AC is blowing on the on the phone. So we could barely hear you. Okay. Uh, so, Chief, while he's working on gotcha, that. Gotcha, 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 <laughs> gotcha. now. <laughs> you hear me now, Kate? Okay. Yes. Yes, I sir. Us? Okay. Look, I apologize, okay? Hey, you're all good. You, this is good. We're happy to have you on. And if we need to let you go, we can do that too. Okay. Yeah. See me? I'm working. See how my life. Who's that? Who's that there? Who's that, Cedric? That's one of my soldiers. Yeah, he's my one of my team leaders. All right. Okay, I'm back. I apologize. We're gonna go. Hey, we're gonna go. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna skip a, 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 a couple of questions here, just to just because I know you're busy and all that, and you know you got soldiers to take care of. So uh, let's let's jump to let's jump to Leah. Let's jump to your question right there. His his uh, his pro competition routine. Sure. Yep. And fighting. What can you, Cedric? What can you share with us about what does your pre um, competition routine consist of? How far out do you start preparing for for a competition? What does that look like? Okay, yeah, it's pretty typical. I uh, started about 12 to 16 weeks. That's three to four months. Depending on what kind of shape I'm in already. Um, usually I never really get um, overweight, especially in the off season. Hey, usually it's because I'm not able to sit on my butt and, and uh, be lazy and get obese, you know? So I'm usually always in pretty good shape generally, uh, especially to be starting a contest diet. Um, and so um, I probably will start my competition prep phase doing about one hour cardio a day, 60 minutes, and, uh, and then one uh, full workout. Um, if I have a little more body fat than normal or if I want to try to speed up the fat burning process, then I'll do two hours of cardio. Um, there's times where I have a lot of uh, physical labor throughout my work day. And in times like that, for example, um, let's just say I'm doing, I'll make up something. Let's say I'm uh, outside cutting grass, okay, for four hours, for example, which I, don't, I won't cut grass. I get soldiers to cut grass, but sometimes I might have to cut grass. <laughs> so four hours of cutting grass would be equivalent to me for one hour of real cardio, right? Um, and so if I was doing some type of physical, hot, sweaty, constant, uh, manual labor for four hours, 
then I would, wouldn't have to do my one 60 minute cardio session. That's the way I try to compensate, you know, real life demands with, you know, what I have to do for competition prep. Um, because if I think about um, all of the demands of doing um, the competition prep, the cardio, and then I got on top of that, you know, do some real uh, intense manual labor for four, six hours, or even eight hours, I could slip into the zone of overtraining because of, you know, how demanding it is on the body. And th there, there's been times that's like that, and I'll lose five pounds in a day. But it won't be five pounds of body fat. It'll be five pounds where the muscles just shrink down and, you know, you become uh, very depleted. And with a competition diet, you know, you got to really have a good balance between all your macronutrients. And so you don't want to have too many carbohydrates in your system because too much carbohydrates releases too much insulin and that can slow down your fat burning process. Okay, well, then you need a lot of carbs to try to compensate for all this manual labor to be able to have energy to do all of the work, right? So what happens if you don't eat a lot of carbs and you do a lot of work? Then the body can turn and start breaking down protein uh, and using that for energy. And so that's what we have to try to avoid. So that's why I try to compensate. If I'm doing a lot of physical manual labor, I try to compensate and at least, you know, I'll skip that day of cardio if I did about four hours of um uh, some type of manual labor for work or something. Um, but other than that, I have one workout session a day uh, <laughs> because, shoot, it would probably be impossible for me to try to do more than that. Um, uh, I probably typically sleep around four hours a day. Um, and so getting up early to do the cardio, then going to work, and then I will do my weight training after work. Um, Let's see, for, for, the, for the most part of my contest prep, I would just train one body part a day. Um, and then as I get closer to the show, like maybe one month out, then I train with very low volume, but I do full body workout. So maybe I, I will only do three sets per body part, but I'll train every body part. Well, what's the point? The point is to try to, keep the small amount of carbs that I am eating, shuttling into the muscle and allowing every body part to receive some type of stimulation every day to stay big. Uh, that's the whole point of it all. Plus, whatever carbohydrates I am eating, let there not be um, a surplus of carbohydrates left over that could be somehow converted into fat. Um, so doing full body workouts can also help with burning fat too. Yeah. Hey, what up? Hey, hey uh, Cedric, we had a, a couple of questions on on the ACFT. Uh, Roy was trying to ask you that before you cut out. What what tips okay, or advice sorry. do you have for soldiers out there on, you know, the new ACFT? I know it's been pushed back and it, there's some changes maybe coming, but what advice okay, do you have? First of all, let me throw this out here. I believe that it's going to be logistically impossible to have every unit in the Army doing the ACFT. It is just too difficult to do. There's so many different instances where somebody needs a PT test, they need to go to school, or somebody needs a PT test for this or for that. And for ACFT, there's so many movement, moving parts and so much involved in it. It's just going to be a logistical nightmare. It really is. Um, I think the only way you could possibly do it is you're going to have to have, you know, for people that are active duty on a base, you could have, you know, several ACFT fields set up. You could have a whole ACFT unit, and they're dedicated to grading and maintaining, you know, the ACFT test and the field. That would be their job. And then a, a unit could come through there and get tested, or a person could schedule a test, come through there and get tested. Uh, but I don't even know if the, if the Army is going to dedicate that amount of manpower to that, because usually... The way, the way it is now, PT tests get done in-house, you know? So if I if I have a team of 15 people, I could, you know, with the right, you know, support system, um, test my own soldiers. Um, and, and with doing it like this, I don't think it's going to be possible. You're going to need people that are certified. Um, and, and the other difficult thing about it is training for the ACFT. You need to be in a damn gym with some real equipment. Now, they got a lot of different ways you can improvise and use improvised equipment until somebody gets hurt using some improvised method of doing an ACFT event. When somebody gets hurt doing, oh, I was trying to improvise a deadlift or I was trying to improvise a leg tuck 
okay, and then you fell and broke your neck or you, you know, you did this and that. So it's going to create a big problem, I think, um, because if, you know, if every group of soldiers doesn't have, you know, $2,500 of equipment to be able to train on properly, then you can't, uh, you can't justifiably test these soldiers on something that you don't make sure they have everything they need to train on it properly, right? So when you leave it up to soldiers, hey, train on this your own way, but then we're gonna test you, test you very specifically, that's gonna be setting these soldiers up for failure now, right? Um, so I, I really think they're pushing it back because they realize they're running into a lot of roadblocks. We're trying to do it. Um, I think it's a good idea for some units it's a good idea for some units that have the type of support necessary or they have the logistical system set up to allow them to do it. But to make it army wide, I think it's going to be very difficult. Um, if I was to give any advice for somebody saying that they're getting ready for the ACFT, it's simple. Look at the events, try to find some equipment that you need to mimic the event at your gym, um, at home too, at a football field, at a stadium. In the backyard, yeah, because doing something is better than doing nothing. But the risk associated with doing things other than the prescribed method is going to be an issue, right? And so what happens? So when this soldier gets injured and they were trying to do something that they thought was a good improvised way and couldn't find out it's not, okay, so now this injury is the soldier's fault. So this injury can't be written up as a, a line of duty injury. So it's not a, a normal PT injury that he suffered while he was trying to train. You get what I'm saying? It's going to be a big ass mess. I really do believe that. Um, and, and, and I think the only way you're going to be able to test these soldiers possibly, or um, the only way you're going to be able to test these soldiers properly is to make sure that they can all properly train. And that, that's going to have to be necessary. Look, I'll be honest, man. We had a first sergeant that was saying, put some sand in these buckets, do deadlifts with that, or put this pole between two vehicles, let a soldier hold each end to make sure it doesn't roll and do your leg tucks there. Man, are you sure about that? Yeah, well, we don't have a lot of pull-up bars so we can put poles between two vehicles. Okay. That is gonna be a problem. You get what I'm saying? You know. <laughs> Uh, or, hey, fill these sandbags up with sand, weigh them to see how much they weigh, and use these for whatever. Okay, well, listen, if I train with sandbags, but then I don't use sandbags on the test, that's going to be a problem. My mechanics aren't going to be right, you know? So I have to be able to train this, the same way that I'm going to be evaluated. That's what I think, th that's what I feel we owe the soldier that to, in order to properly evaluate them. Can training any type of way help you improve? Yes, you can start at this one point and I couldn't do but three of these and now I can do five because I trained doing something. Yes, that is possible, but I don't think we can rightfully evaluate their performance on something that we didn't make sure that they had the proper training. Especially doing this safely, right? That's I think that's Come the key on, that you're hitting on here. Because safe, safety is the key. Yeah, we can put you out there and let you do whatever and pray to God that you don't get hurt. But when people start getting hurt training for the, not, not taking the ACFT, but when soldiers start getting hurt train, listen, because the ACFT looks a lot like CrossFit, okay? And let's be honest, how many injuries do people get with CrossFit training? I'm not talking about how many people get hurt in a CrossFit competition, which is what an ACFT test would be. I'm talking about how many people get injured doing CrossFit training a lot. And when, when those LODs start rolling in, you know, when these injured shoulders and, you know, hurt lower backs and knees and stuff start coming in, that's when they're going to say, hold on a second, you know, because how much risk is associated with doing push-ups, sit-ups and a two-mile run? You know what I mean? So I think they're going to have to rethink this. Will it be great for some units? Yes. Will it be great for some soldiers at a certain point in their career, like initial entry? Yes. Will it be great for um, units as they get ready for, for pre-mobilization? Yes. But every day, all day, you know, look, and I mean the training aspect of it, not the testing of it, but training this way for pre-mobilization, training this way as initial entry. Is that beneficial? Yes. But training like this every day, certain instances, maybe, but I believe all day, every day, all year, you're going to start to, to have a lot of uh, injuries associated with that. It's a hazard just alone by itself.
even in a perfect situation, there's still a lot of hazard associated with that. You know, now we can take somebody like you that's in tip top shape. You know, we can take somebody that's it's fucking awesome and they're doing this stuff at the gym anyway or they're doing this stuff at home or whatever even using improvised methods they do that on their own anyway even that guy could possibly get injured at any given time now think about somebody that's never done this stuff in their life think about people that are borderline with their physical fitness you know stuff like that maybe somebody that um, just got through a pregnancy or somebody that just got pregnant you know somebody that's had a pre-existing injury some of this stuff could really aggravate things you know so I was going to say, right, uh, I could tell you're very passionate about this. Yeah. I'm looking at the comments here on my phone <laughs> as they're rolling through and, you know, you're very passionate about this. So let's, let's switch gears. And I want you, what advice do you have to give someone that's just starting out with weights and wants to get bigger? Okay. The, listen, the advice that I have is what nobody wants to hear. Okay. Th that advice is be patient. You have to be patient. You know, they say Rome wasn't built in a day. You can't grow muscles immediately. It just doesn't work like that. And what happens is as we start training, we want to see what? What do we want to see? We want to see results. We don't want to see improved performance. We want to see fucking results. And that's it. And a lot of times when we when the results that we're looking for seem to not come fast enough, then maybe we want to try to adjust our methods. Maybe we want to try to adjust our supplementation and things like that or adjust our diet because we don't see what we want to see. But growing muscle is a very slow process. It happens so slowly that you don't even see it happening, right? It's just that one day you look at a picture of you from last year and you notice that you're bigger now or you're better now. Or, you know, maybe uh, the clothes that you used to wear, all of a sudden your pants don't fit the same or your shirt doesn't fit the same no more. But you never wake up every day and look at yourself in the mirror and say, man, I'm bigger today. It don't happen like that. <laughs> and uh, so if we could avoid that thinking trap, then maybe we can avoid, you know, getting into the situations where we start to now look at our body and feel like we have, well, we don't even feel like we have body dysmorphia. We believe our thinking is normal, but you develop body dysmorphia because you're never satisfied with what you see. Because what you're focused on is what you want to look like. And you're comparing yourself every day to what you want to look like. And not knowing that as you grow two pounds, the you that you want to look like is also two pounds bigger. So you never reach that goal. When you've gained 10 pounds, the you that you want to look like is also 10 pounds bigger than the new you. So you never reach that. So you have to understand that, hey, let's just take this thing day by day, step by step, do the best that I can and let, let's go and let's take everything as it comes. You know, and not put so much pressure on yourself to look a certain way. Number one, most important, do not compare yourself to anybody else. Don't compare your progress to anybody else's. Don't compare your physique to anybody else's. Don't compare your goals to anybody else's. Don't try to want to look like the way somebody else looks because we're all so unique and so different. And, you know, the buddy that you train with, maybe his biceps pop quickly and yours don't. So now you're going to be frustrated and you're going to be in the gym training and you're going to be hating yourself because you're not seeing the things that you want to see simply because you're subconsciously comparing yourself to someone else that has a different set of genetics from you, you know, and all you really need to do is compare yourself to the old you, compare yourself to the old you. What do you want to do? You want to be a better version of you. You don't want to be that. You don't want to look like that. You want to look, create an ideal and create an image, create a vision that is a better version of you. Okay, well, you know what that also takes? That takes a realistic outlook on what you are. What am I? What do I have the potential to be? Okay, look, I'm a black dude, right? Most black dudes don't got big calves. I can't get stupid and say, man, I sure wish I had some calves like Justin Compton. My calves are never gonna look like Justin Compton no matter what I do, right? So I have to be realistic about what my potential is. Yeah, I want bigger calves. I want my calves to be bigger because if I keep looking at my calves and notice that they don't look like Justin Compton's, I'm going to be pissed off at my calves. Well, guess what happens now? When you're cursing this part of your body that doesn't give you the results that you want, 
is just like a neglected, abused child. It's never going to perform properly because of, of all the negative energy that you're projecting to it. When you look at your abs and when you look at your body fat and it's not getting to where you want and you're fucking pissed off about it and you're cussing it. Oh man, I just want, oh, I suck, I suck, I suck. And you're beating it to death. So I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to train four hours to try to get this progress because you don't have the patience. You're only going to make your progress take longer right? So, so we all have to have a realistic outlook of what we are, who we are, what we have the potential to be, and strive to be an improved version of us. And sometimes, sometimes the changes that take place in us through training is not physical at all. Sometimes it's psychological. Sometimes it takes mental and emotional changes that happen first before the physical changes can even take place, okay? I have another, another thing I want to give you too. Sometimes, look, you in the military, I bet you you've had a Dell computer before, and I bet you it took an hour to, to boot up for you in the morning, right? So you would go in, you would log into it, and then you would go fix your coffee, do whatever else you had to do, and come back to check to see if it's up yet because it boots up so slow, okay? And God knows if you have to do a software update that takes days, right? Okay, well, your body is the same way. Sometimes you can train and you make immediate progress because your system is already able to facilitate those changes, right? Okay, so now six months later or a year later, we feel like we've hit a plateau and we feel like we're not making changes. What do we wanna do? We wanna adjust some things, right? Well, guess what? During that time is the most important time to keep everything the same. Keep pushing, keep stimulating the muscle, keep trying to get yourself to a point where you're making progress or at least attempting progress, right? Because this is your system trying to rewire just look this is a crazy analogy but it makes sense your system now internally is trying to rewire itself reprogram itself to facilitate those changes that will then be visual later okay so maybe your circulatory system is is creating an upgrade for itself uh maybe your cardio respiratory is making a you know an upgrade to itself so you can't see any visual changes but that don't mean changes aren't taking place inside that are going to facilitate the physical changes that you'll see later. You know, I always tell that, you know, back when I was a personal trainer and you have people, I haven't lost any weight in three weeks. Okay, that's no problem. You still keep doing what you were doing because your, your body has got to catch up now and it's got to rewire some things in order to be able to give you the next set of progress that's, that's coming, you know? So look, there's no way for me to give my best advice in one sentence. Uh, like, hey, just squat if you want big legs. That's my advice. No, There's no way to give a one sentence <laughs> advice because all of that that I just said is very important for a beginner to understand as they take this journey. Uh, another thing that is really important for a beginner, uh, if I had to give them some advice, my advice is that there is no advice. When somebody says do this, usually they're giving you this advice based on their experience, their situation, what they've been through and their interpretation of the knowledge that they've gathered, right? Um, well, somebody else may give you a completely different uh, thing on what their advice would be. Somebody else will say something completely different. If I ask you how to grow big legs, you'll say one thing, somebody else will say something different. How should I train in order to grow muscles? Somebody will say one thing, somebody will say something else. What I say is experiment with everything. Find what you like, find what you enjoy, and do those things and wait for your progress. You can't get progress in two days. You try something for a while, gauge your progress. What is a while? I say three months. Try this method for three months consistently and then make a change. Try this next thing for three months. Gauge your progress from this thing to that thing. Not just how much muscle grew, but how did it, how did it feel? You know, did I gain more flexibility, more agility, more endurance? Or did I gain more strength? Not just what do the muscles look like? So give yourself a three month trial period for this. So basically at all times, what you're doing is going through experimental periods with your body, okay? Why am I saying all this? Because now you are taking the first steps through creating your own best advice for you. Instead of taking somebody else's advice for your body, you're creating what you can learn for yourself that works best for you, right? What's the best stress relief for me? I might like watching porn. Somebody else might want to smoke some weed. Get what I'm saying? Two different methods, right? It accomplishes that for me. 
smoking weed accomplishes that for you. So you have to you have to be willing to take the time to study, gain knowledge and understanding and experience for yourself without just looking for the give me the best advice, give me the key. Because there has to be, Cedric, you're this big and I'm this big. There has to be a magic secret that I'm missing that you know, tell me that. No, the secret is consistency. The secret is you just don't stop no matter what. You don't quit. And then you be crazy enough to do Okay, did I get disconnected again? There you go. You're back. You're back. Go ahead. What I want to say is, usually what happens is some people are just too stupid or too crazy to stop. And what happens is 10 years later, they're big or 10 years later, they look great. That's usually what it is. Uh, and, and so that that's, okay, chapter three on what the best advice would be. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cedric. All good stuff. So just want to take a quick second to read you some comments. A lot of people are saying hello. Uh, Vern says, who is Sarge? Um, somebody's asking advice to get a good diet to lose weight. Um, mm -hmm. And then we also have Army MWR. So they are tuning in and asking if you happen to use any MWR gyms um, and they're hoping that you would yeah of course anytime i'm on base uh or anywhere near a base um I, the only time i won't go on base is when the line is too long at the gate to get in <laughs> that's the only time i won't go but if i'm close by or if i'm already on base for training or something i always go to the to the, to the local gym on base um I, I i actually like that i like to see all the soldiers working out i actually get energy from from seeing that and i get inspired and get motivated from seeing all the little soldiers working out, you know, at the different gyms. I love it. Julie said, this is a, a comment from earlier. That is my life goal to get people to do stuff without cussing them out. <laughs> okay. Tell, okay. Get bigger, Listen, girl, Julie, get bigger and you'll Julie, scare them. Julie, you need to hear this. Cussing them out is the funnest part is the, the funnest, <laughs> the most fun. Okay, when you can't cuss them out, you're actually missing the fun part. You need to be able to cuss them out. <laughs> Chief, did I miss anything? No, no, I think you got you got all the you got all the questions. You already hit on the diet earlier. Uh, he hit on a lot of the questions that were asked, but uh, I think you have a question there about to ask Cedric where we could find them on social media and everything. Oh, you're right. Um, remind us, Cedric, where can we follow your journey with your bodybuilding, your weightlifting, and, and anything related to Cedric? Where can we find you on social? Uh, uh, so <laughs> I can't guarantee. TikTok? I can't guarantee that you can always follow my journey on social media because I'm not very active. <laughs> like I'm supposed to be, okay? But I try. Well, it but, sounds like you're busy, so that's okay. Yeah. So, okay. So I got a I got a big boss, and then I have a an athlete manager. My athlete manager completely understands, and my big boss is like, whatever, you know. So, <laughs> so I still gotta at least try, right? I'm not the selfie type. I guess I could just take selfies every day and meet the requirement but that's stupid you know so i i don't i don't do that but um yeah i gotta be careful about like where i'm positioned what's in the background what's my location especially when i'm on duty i gotta be real careful about stuff like that so i use that as my excuse to oh no i can't post because uh, yeah, I gotta be careful. <laughs> yeah but uh, listen please i hope all of the people can see this in the very near future i am going to attempt to try to communicate with everybody that sends me messages on social media. Every time I try to respond to a few messages and I say, you know what, I'm going to answer everybody. It, I end up getting overwhelmed because it's too many. Um, but to everybody out there that follows me and supports me and my style and the way I do things, I love y'all. I do. There's been times where I felt like quitting. And then I said, I can't quit for all of the people that are expecting me to keep doing what I'm doing. I can't quit for them. Can I quit for myself? Yeah, I could just go to the gym and be happy with going to the gym. 
but I have to keep showing up for them. And the people who support me is what inspires me uh, because, you know, I probably won't be able to satisfy the judges. So my goal is to be able to satisfy the people that support me with my presentation. And that's what I try to do. And that means everything to me. So to all of y'all that are watching this or get the word to whoever, to my soldiers out there, all of y'all, man, listen, I really do love you. And, and that's just not some stuff that some PR person told me to say. I really do. Uh, because I understand that, you know, look, I, I don't have a marketing scheme anyway. So anybody that's following me is because they really do care because I'm not even, I don't even do my stuff like that, right? So that really matters to me. Somebody said it was, I think it may have been my boss. He said, you know, we've studied the analytics and all of your followers are actual followers. They're not like fake followers. Whatever that means, it means a lot to me. So I really appreciate everybody, man. And, and uh, I want to try to do better. Of course, I want to try to perform better on stage. I want to try to be a better version of myself. But I also want to not give up, uh, keep doing what I'm doing, and be better on social media, too. I need to try to do that. Right? So, so to help I everyone out, to... so help Cedric out out there, I think you can find him on Instagram, Cedric McMillan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Cedric McMillan on Instagram, Cedric McMillan on Facebook. I downloaded TikTok and then I erased it because somebody said they can they can spy on your life from China mm -hmm. with TikTok. So I, I I deleted it. Plus, I don't make dance videos that often, so I hadn't been using that either. <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing I'm not doing that either. Hey, Cedric, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thanks to Redcon One for hooking hooking us up with you and getting to spend a, a few you know about 30, 40 minutes here with, of course, everybody out there in Facebook land. I appreciate the candor. I appreciate you being you and telling us how it is. It comes across right, that you're truly passionate about what you do and you really care about your soldiers and, and everything you're doing out there. So thank you so much. Uh, America's airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, and Coasties, appreciate you and everything you're doing. We wish you the best on your future competitions and your continued service in the United States Army. Thank you. Stick okay. around real quick. I'm going to ask you a question after this. So stick around okay. real quick. Thank you so much. We're out. Okay, thank you.